Hey there, I'm Jen Mueller, host of the Unrivaled Sports Podcast. At Unrivaled, we introduce sports fans to the pro athletes they haven't heard enough about. On this podcast, you'll hear from rising and underdog athletes who share their journey to becoming pros and their passions outside of their sport. Today, our guest is Lance McCullers Jr., starting pitcher for the Houston Astros, a World Series champion, a 2017 All-Star, and a former Gatorade National Player of the Year in high school. His athletic talent and ability is obvious. But have you heard the whole story? And do you know about the passion that fuels his foundation? That is just one of the topics we'll discuss today. Hey, Lance, thanks for joining us. Absolutely. I'm very happy to uh, very happy to be here. You know, we read through the list of your athletic accomplishments, and it's obvious that you are an established professional now, but no athlete just bursts onto the scene. There's a lot of work that goes into that. And I know your dad was a big league pitcher. And I'm wondering, how did that influence you? Yeah, you know, growing up uh, with my dad, you know, being a former big leaguer was something that for sure a lot of my teammates thought was super cool. Um, But my dad never really pushed us into baseball or into sports in general. He was very supportive of kind of what we wanted to do. But when we started getting older and, you know, started getting more into sports and more into baseball uh, specifically, you know, he was definitely there to, you know, kind of guide us and mentor us and definitely relay his passion um, for, for the game on, on to me and to my younger siblings. So I think the passion and the, the, what it takes to, to be at the highest level and be successful at the highest level is, is something that he definitely was able to, um, to pass on and still continue to this day uh, help me with. I know that you didn't just have an interest in baseball. How many sports did you play in high school? Yeah, you know, in high school in Florida, it's, 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 it's tough. All those seasons kind of kind of run together um but I did play basketball as well in high school I played football before that but um you know winter ball in high school uh, was during football season and I decided that baseball was definitely the better route and basketball was kind of the overlap that that I had an opportunity to play so I played basketball which was really my favorite sport uh growing up but um I realized that you know I'm a little bit uh, vertically challenged and uh Baseball was definitely my, 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 my best sport. That's a tough decision to make, though. I mean, was that a, a conversation with your parents, or was that just really good self-realization? Yeah, that was just realization. You know, it's just watching people and, and understanding that. I definitely loved baseball as well, and it was something that I was, was far, far better at and, and, and knew that a career path in, in, in that sport may may be realistic and something that I wanted to pursue, which probably happened around, like, the 10th grade. And, you know, I think that that's a really formative time in a lot of people's lives. And there are still coaches and teachers that I keep in touch with. I'm wondering, is there a coach or teacher that you still text or email or call or have correspondence with? Oh, uh, yeah, it, it's so easy now uh, with social media. Um, that teacher that I still um, speak with a lot and I'm close to is actually my um, was my senior year uh, English literature teacher, Mr. Freeman. Uh, we we still communicate on Instagram quite often, and really my coaches all the way through my life, including my high school co- coach Richie Warren and my AAU coach growing up, uh, Chris Leto, who's his son's my best friend and and is actually my godfather. Uh, we're we're still very close and talk um, all the time. So I got lucky growing up. I had a lot of great coaches and a lot of great mentors that I'm able to uh, keep in touch with. So who's the person that you text or call before or after every game? Before and after every game. Well, I definitely obviously speak to my wife. I definitely speak to my dad. And my grandfather um, actually texts me recaps of every inning I pitch uh, <laughs> to my phone in between innings. It's a real thing, and they're long. He's the best. He actually has his uh, laptop uh, set up in his living room on like a little stand and that's in live time. And then the TV is a little bit delayed. So he'll watch the laptop pitch and then he'll watch the TV pitch. And then as the inning is over, he texts me this long uh, laundry list of his uh, opinions and thoughts on the inning. And like, well, like text me motivational things as if I'm reading these during the game, but I think it's his way to cope with him being nervous. So <laughs> I definitely speak to my grandfather a lot. Um, after games because of everything he, he sends me during the game. And is it good stuff? Like, do you enjoy that one or every once in a while? Oh, like, yeah. Okay, you know, he'll be like, Hey buddy, you know, that inning right there, it, it, it was tough, but, but you, you know, you, you, you stayed strong and made good pitches to so-and-so and such and such. And, 
you know, we need to focus on throwing this pitch maybe a little more dur- during the game. It seems like it's working well tonight. You know, stay strong out there type stuff. Um, so they're good. I enjoy them. Uh, he's someone that was huge in my development um, with, with sports and life in general. Um, so I always enjoy those texts from him. At what point did you realize? I mean, I, I know that you made the choice in high school to stick with baseball and to give up basketball. But at what point did you realize that you had the potential to be a professional athlete? Well, that was always my dream uh, growing up. And I know that that probably is, uh, you know, aligns with millions of other kids uh, around the world. Um, in high school, I made the varsity team as a freshman, um, which uh, I was hoping to make, of course. I felt like you know, maybe I'll go in there, have a great tryout. and They'll, they'll, they'll see some potential in me. So I made the team and we actually had a pretty big injury to uh, our starting third baseman um, that season and preseason. And so I was able to start my entire freshman year at third base and actually won um, the national freshman of the year award um, for uh, all freshmen around the country. And uh, I, I, I played very well in, in a strong baseball, baseball area in Tampa. And from that moment on, I went to play with, um, you know, Team USA that, that, and other big travel ball organizations that summer and played el- kids that were older than me, you know, kids that were 17, 18, 19 years old. And I held my own. I said, you know, I think I, think I can go for this. Just so evident that this is what you were meant to do. But there's always something that could have been a roadblock. And I'm curious, what's the obstacle that could have sidetracked or derailed your career if you had let it? Oh, man. Well, just recently, you know, obviously I, I, I had Tommy John surgery um, about uh, 15 months ago. And, you know, that surgery is something that a lot of players have. And, it, you know, the, the surgery and, and the rehab has gotten to a point in time where, um, you know, it, it's, it's pretty uniform a, a, across and many guys come back from that surgery even better, but it's no guarantee. So that would be one thing I could have definitely, uh, felt bad for myself during that period of time and, um, not put my best foot forward. But for me, the biggest thing would have definitely been probably my first or second year in pro ball as an 18, 19 year old kid being away from his friends, his family, um, you know, my wife and I were, we, we, we've been together since I was 16. So we, you know, she was in college and I was away in the minor league. So that was an interesting, you know, adjustment and, you know, growth period. And so those type of things and struggling with performance and just being accustomed to the, to the baseball life as a job, um, sometimes could felt like it could get the best of me, but luckily I have a great support system in place and uh, it didn't, but, but that would have been something that, I, I'll reflect back on, and I always tell people when they're going into pro ball, make sure you're ready, uh, make sure you understand that this is now your full time job, and you know you're, you're you know as much as you may not want it to be, you are defined by you know how you perform, and um, you know that could have been a moment or moments for me that that I kind of I went off the path, but luckily I uh, you know I I I stay I stay committed. But what other advice goes with that? Because telling somebody is different than when they actually experience it for themselves. So what no, other that's, advice? That's the hundred percent truth. And, you know, it, it's kind of like when your dad tells you something and or your parents tell you something and, 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 you know, you just totally disregard it. And, and until you experience those things for yourself and you reflect back, they're like, man, you know, if I would have just listened, I probably would have avoided this, but everyone has to go through their own experience. Everyone has to draw on, on their own, um, you know, own time periods and, and how they deal with things. But for me, my biggest advice to anyone is just make sure you are hundred percent committed, have both feet in the door, uh, before you make that commitment, uh, to yourself and to an organization and just make sure you're ready for, for the grind because it, it definitely baseball is different than the other sports. Um, there is a, a minor league period where you make no money, where you are not, living in cool cities where, um, you know, things are tough and uh, you have to be okay with that and you have to be mentally ready to, to meet that challenge. And there is a point that you start dreaming of opening day every year because of all of those things, right? When you have overcome those challenges, at what point during the off season do you start thinking about opening day? Well, for me, um, you know, I didn't play all last season. Uh, so I've been dreaming of opening day being able to play for uh, 16 months now since I had that surgery. Um, but 
you know, the season ends typically and, you know, good, bad, or, or, or indifferent, you kind of take those couple weeks and you, you kind of decompress and maybe do a little bit of traveling, maybe spend some time, go back home, spend time with some family and friends that um, you haven't seen in a while. But after that, you know, you start training again and you start getting back in that mindset. So for me, I think every year right about, right around mid-December to late December, you start really feeling ready for uh, the season again. You start really looking forward to going to spring training and ultimately coming out of spring training um, and, and, and going to opening day. One more question about opening day, and then I got to talk to you about your foundation. What do you recall about your first opening day? My first opening day was in Yankee Stadium in 2016. I got called up in um, May of 2015, pitched the whole year with the big league club that season, got a little bit of playoff experience my first season as a big leaguer, which um, I think many people uh, maybe listening don't understand, but the guys will play 10, 12, 15 years in their, you know, respected professions and never get a taste of that postseason, never get a taste of um, what it's like uh, to feel, um, you know, that intensity. And so for me, as a, as a 21 year old kid, being able to um, experience that and then go into my next opening day in New York stadium um, was just, you know, growing up as a Yankees fan and cheering for the Yankees um, down in spring training was, was, was just really cool for me. And, um, you know, I'll never, I'll never forget that day. And, uh, you know, my, our old manager, AJ Hinch, uh, you know, uh, let me know to, to really embrace it and take it in because there's nothing like your first opening day. And, and he was absolutely right. All opening days are great, but, but nothing's like that first one. Now away from baseball, it's not as if you don't have enough going on on the field. You are a dog person. Where did your love of dogs come from? You know, growing up, uh, we had a we had a black lab, a rescue black lab. Her name was Missy. Um, she was uh, just the most amazing dog uh, for my for you know my early parts of my childhood up to I was probably about um, eight or nine years old before she you know she passed. And I think just having that type of love from from a dog. Uh, early on in my life, just really set me on that path of uh, of love for them, and 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 I love all animals. And um, when we got to Houston in uh, 2015, we started volunteering at you know animal rescues and started uh, spreading the word of, of, about the uphill battles that animals and shelters face, especially in cities like Houston where the overpopulation is um, is vast and. We launched our own foundation in 2016, and uh, everything has been going amazing. The Houston community supports us. They believe in what we're doing, and uh, it's been really cool to see how our foundation has grown. What inspired you and your wife to start that foundation specifically? Because, like you said, you were volunteering and helping other organizations. Yeah, Wait, for sure. Um, I don't know. We just felt like we were volunteering. You know, we were, we were out there. We were, you know, we were kind of fighting the good fight with everybody. We were uh, lending, we were lending, you know, we were doing, I was doing autograph sessions. I was doing meet and greets with people at rescues to try to promote adoption and spay and neuter and um, just trying to have people understand how amazing these shelter animals are and how loving they are. We have three of them, um, two from Houston, and they're just, you know, a part of our family. And in 2016, you know, I just said, I think we, we can do more. I think we can make a, a, a greater impact. And so we launched our foundation. It was actually good timing because um, we kind of got our feet wet a little bit. And then Harvey unfortunately happened and our foundation was able to step up in a major way and save thousands of animals life um, with uh, transportation methods, you know, flying on private jets uh, that people uh, were donating at cost and putting them on, on, on large shipments to surrounding States uh, for rescues to take in dogs in that capacity. And since then, our foundation has been partnering with um, organizations in Houston ever since, saving around anywhere, give or take, um, five to 8,000 animals a year. Uh, last year, we were about that 8,000 mark um, with transportation and sending animals to safety and also paying for medical bills. So we felt like we could make a bigger impact. And ultimately, um, that's what we have done. And it's been really great to uh, to be able to support Houston in that way. So how do you encourage people to support the cause? And where do you guys take this next? Yeah, you know, a lot of people will say, you know, well, Lance, you know, I, I just don't have, you know, the funds to donate. And I said, listen, monetar- monetarily, 
donating to a cause is is great. And that's how a lot of people choose to support causes. But what most causes need is they need people who are willing to volunteer. They need people who can go to the shelters and, and spend time with those animals. They need people who are willing to foster those animals. Uh, you know, for example, we have a, we have a fostering uh, transport program where we'll take animals directly from the shelter and we'll place them in homes for a short two week period. And then those dogs will go from that home to a transport to the forever home. Without that middle ground, without that foster in between, uh, for the quarantine period to make sure the dog's not sick, to make sure the dog is adjusting well before it travels, all these animals wouldn't be able to be saved. So there are so many ways to be involved. Um, and a lot of it is just time. And a lot of it is your time. A lot of it is, your, is, is just to give your heart to whatever passion that you feel calls to you. And that was most of my, mostly my advice to people looking to um, get involved is to just donate yourself and donate your time. Um, and then where it goes from here is, we're hoping to expand our transport program to uh, more rescues. Right now we have two on board. And like I mentioned, we're saving around 8,000 animals a year uh, from that transport program. We want to make, we want to double or triple those numbers, get up to, you know, 15, 20,000 animals a year. And then eventually one day we want to have our own sanctuary. We want to, we want to have a place where we can take animals in that for some reason we just can't find fosters for or can't find homes on the other side of those transports and um, want to take them in to be able to live a, a life of happiness um, they deserve. That is incredible. And you talk about like, giving of your time and your resources and your heart. You have definitely done that in the community. You've done that with the foundation. And you have done that with us today. I hate that we don't have more time to talk to you, but I love that we have gotten to hear more of your story. Thanks, Lance, for joining the Unrivaled podcast. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. This is the Unrivaled Sports Podcast, giving fans a refreshing look at sports. I'm Jen Mueller. Please find our complete profile of Lance McCullers Jr. of the Houston Astros at unrivaled-sports.com. And follow us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Look for Unrivaled's next profile of a likable and underestimated pro athlete coming soon.